welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 302. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and I'm returning again with a second-timer to the podcast. I believe it's 1 a.m. his time when he's recording, so he's making a big sacrifice to be here with us. I've got Tum Energia on the line. Tum, how's it going, my friend? Great, man. Great, man. I love being back with you, Steve, and uh, not a big sacrifice on the time. I am idle anyways, as you know, but... Guys, CGI is happening right now. That's a big sacrifice. We are recording on August 16th, so we are going into the biggest week of grappling this year, probably next year as well. A um, lot of BJJ Mental Model sponsored athletes on the mat this time. We've got Joseph Chen. Yeah, my son, Joseph Chen. On the ADCC side, because I've got to play both sides of the field, right? I've got Marco Ciccarelli, Brianna St. Marie, Chris Wojcik, and Liz Mitrovic. So you are going to see the nine circles all over the place from BJJ Mental Models this year. Very excited. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool, man. Uh, big sacrifice for you, man, that are not watching uh, live at the moment, but we'll watch it after this. <laughs> you know what? I usually don't watch stuff like this live anyway, because I like to be able to pause and get up and grab a snack. You know, I don't like to feel glued to my television one of the nice things about modern technology is everything is video on demand so it's not like when i was a kid where you had to kind of stop you had to sit there and wait and watch something and you couldn't control when it was going to be on and yeah can't skip commercials yeah yeah now interestingly i think that's semi-related to the topic we're going to be discussing here today <laughs> but before we get into that it's been a while since you've been on the podcast tomb so why don't you give yourself just a quick introduction yeah thank you so my name is tim and i'm from the netherlands if you guys don't know, it's Amsterdam, <laughs> but a bit more than Amsterdam. I'm a jiu-jitsu coach. I'm a black belt. I started out from Gracie Barra. Now I run my own team, Energy of Martial Arts. We're in like five uh, cities. I have a YouTube channel with the same name, Energy of Martial Arts, and I teach seminars abroad, and I have some DVDs on BJ Phonetics. And most of all, I'm just a big jiu-jitsu nerd and love sharing uh, stuff on jiu-jitsu and help other people around. So I think that sums it up a little bit. I used to be an elementary teacher. Last time we spoke, Steve, I thought we were speaking about that subject and teaching in jiu-jitsu and teaching philosophies. And today we are talking about yeah, short content and content in general in jiu-jitsu, right? That's right. Now I am going to turf this over to you because I know you've got some thoughts, but you're completely right. That's a great topic to discuss. I am always interested in seeing the content landscape and how people's attention is getting divided between the different types of content out there. One of the big changes in the content landscape over the last few years has been the emergence of short form content. So this push to have sub minute videos, just really, really quick hit videos. Of course, you see this on TikTok, you see this on Instagram reels, you see this with YouTube shorts, but Tum, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'd like to talk about how short form content applies to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, the pros and cons of this approach, where it's helpful, where it's maybe not so helpful, but tell me your thoughts. Tell me what you found so far. Yeah. So first off to everyone listening, congratulations. You guys beat the odds. Your average attention span is longer than most people nowadays and listening to a podcast anyway, and uh, some fun statistics maybe to start off with, which also kind of blew my mind because I'm doing short content myself, but I never went into the statistics or the facts. But uh, what I discovered, Steve, is that most videos around under 19 seconds, did you know that they review over 50% of their viewers and that the whole short form video content ads program will surpass $10 billion this year? At least 75% of people prefer video over text for learning about products or services. A lot of other facts, very interesting for people to know about short content videos in general. And this is only focused on videos and, and marketing on that. Uh, viewers retain 95% of a message conveyed through video. That's why people love looking up for videos. And I saw some people in the comments somewhere on a, a how do you say, a, a research, a statistic research, saying that they even prefer TikTok sometimes to search up stuff as as opposed to uh, Google. I think you and I mostly use Google or people from our generation. Nowadays, people use TikTok to find recipes to cook or anything uh, related to learn. And I think there's a lot of jiu-jitsu guys out there that also are shifting from long format content to the shorter, quick techniques on Instagram or TikTok, as you said, or YouTube shorts. I think there's a big shift happening there. And the question today is, is it happening for the better? And is it the, how can we play around that? Even you with a podcast, for example, right? Most of your podcasts are around 50 minutes. Am I correct, Steve? We generally target around an hour, give or take. That said, though, on the topic of shorter form content, we've recently started creating mini episodes and launching those as well. Yeah, I saw those. I, I love those. Yeah, those are much shorter. I mean, they're still longer than a lot of short form content. I target somewhere between five and 10 minutes for those. But we're definitely experimenting with that. And the main reason 
reason from our standpoint is because after having done this podcast for about six years, we get a lot of people asking, where do I even start? How do I begin to process all of this information from BJJ mental models and having a series of just quick hit episodes that quickly bring people up to speed is a, a useful resource and also a good refresher for people who have been around for a long time. So we're experimenting with the short form stuff as well. Although I have not yet got to the point where I'm distilling stuff down to sub 60 seconds, although I might do that. Yeah, but that's for the podcast. Now on uh, Instagram, you have some short format as well. You have the videos. I saw one with, I'm not sure if I pronounced her name correctly, but Domienka. Yes, Dominika Oblanite, 10-time world champ, four times a black belt. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a really cool video. And she was talking, she was explaining some stuff. I think it was a snippet or part of a podcast or something you guys spoke about. But the cool thing is, and this is what's really interesting about good short format content, is that the things that are happening aren't only the time. If you look at short content, and we're talking only about time, that which is saying maybe 90 seconds, 60 seconds or even shorter or three minutes, that's easy. Then we can wrap it up now in 10 minutes. But it's also other things that apply that make short content very interesting. It's like when you look at that video, for example, I don't know if you made it or uh, your media team, but you're changing angles every few seconds. You see this in, in group movies as well. When people have a conversation, the angle switches. So you see the same people having a conversation, but you see it from both points of views or from side angle or so your your brain gets a new dopamine shot every time you see the angle change every so many seconds there's b-roll footage in the video as she is speaking so she's speaking about a subject and then things move in the background i've been playing around with that in our videos as well and i see a lot of coaches on the internet doing that as well on strategic techniques and then some things i'm, I'm not sure if i saw it in the, that in your video but what we're seeing in general is people pausing screens adding text in the video so the video has moving people or moving techniques let's just keep it jiu-jitsu but also there's sound so there's audio people explaining and then there's also text in screen. I heard that even a lot of English speakers, so Americans, they even watch movies with English subtitles because it's so convenient to just have the text in screen whilst listening to the audio. And then we add things like what you see in short format videos, like arrows or question marks or big red circles within all of this editing and all of this stuff happening in a very short video to provide even more focus and dopamine for your brain. And I, I thought it was really cool to see that on one of the videos on your page as well to see how that funnels people into the mini episodes and then into the bigger episodes, right? Actually, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up. I will give credit where it was due. That clip that you're referring to was actually made by Digitsu and it was to co-promote Dominica's new instructional. So we were helping her promote that. She put out an awesome new instructional called The Art of the Game Plan that she launched on Digitsu. And she also came on our podcast around the same time to talk about game planning strategy. So we were doing some co-promotion with them. Hey, I love reels like that because I don't have to produce them. For people who have never actually shot video content in that kind of quick hit reel format, I think they would be surprised at how much work it is. It is so hard to make a good 30 second reel. And I say this as someone who does a lot of long form content, a lot of essays on jujitsu. It's really hard to get your message across and edit it and make it snappy in just a few seconds. Let me tell you from my perspective, as a, I have a YouTube channel, we just hit like 21, 22,000 subscribers. We're doing okay and it's, it's growing. We started out with longer videos, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes and making systems. We quickly switched down to seven, six minutes, making a little bit shorter, cutting right to the techniques, etc. And then we added short formats like, I think a year or two ago, one of the things we started out are called quick fixes. So it's sort of like, okay, guys, quick fix. We're stuck in this position. Let's fix it in 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And I can tell you from my personal experience, filming a few of these quick fixes usually takes even more time to film, edit, and release as opposed to a YouTube video from six or seven minutes. That's crazy, right? And the weird part is also that the short videos, they feel like once you put them out there, they get watched a few times and then it feels like it's gone forever. Whilst a YouTube video or like one of your podcasts, for example, or an instructional, it's there forever and people are re-watching it and new people are watching it. And it kind of feels sometimes that short content is necessary as an owner of YouTube channel or podcast, or whatever. But it's also, it takes so much work, like you just said, and so much editing for only 20 seconds or 30 seconds that sometimes I feel like, wow, is it even worth it? And that's an interesting thing because there's some information about some guys who even deleted their short content stuff because it does attract new people. And here's the fun part. You get more views, you might get more subscribers, but they are the people who only want to watch the short formats. So the percentage of the people that actually watch your true videos where you have ads running, etc., they get less and less. So it seems like you're getting more and more viewers and more and more views and subscribers, but not the quality of subscribers and viewers that you might want or might 
look to engage with. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. And it's something that anyone who has worked in content industries will understand. It is easy to chase vanity metrics because you see the number go up, but that doesn't always equate to actual results or actual revenue. Social media is notoriously bad at this, where people will chase getting as many followers and as many likes as they possibly can. But at the end of the day, they're not actually making money off of it because, I mean, that's not how you make money. It is possible to leverage an audience to generate revenue, but it's no guarantee that it's going to happen. And part of our strategy at BJJ Mental Models has been to really not focus so much on those channels because, I mean, first of all, you don't own your identity on social media. You're basically there by the grace of the platform and they can stop promoting you or remove you at any time. So our focus has always been on things we have more control over, like the podcast and the newsletter. Um, but you're absolutely right that there's different ways that people engage different types of content. Something we've talked about on the podcast before is this idea of learning modalities, that sometimes if you deliver the same message in different ways, you can kind of hit people at different points in the day or at different periods of their life, and it might resonate better than if they receive that message from a different method. I mean, you'll hear people talk about learning styles, like I'm a visual learner, I'm an audio learner. Actually, it turns out that's been studied quite a bit, and that's a myth. There's no such thing as a learning style. But I think there is something to be said about hitting people with the right message in the right format, in the right place at the right time. And that's an interesting example you bring up about how if you focus on short form content, yes, you can attract a certain type of viewer, but that might not ultimately be the type of viewer you want because they're not the ones that are easy to monetize. And that's something that you really have to think about if you're a content creator. People probably don't understand that it's really hard to make money just from advertising dollars on a social platform like YouTube. So if people are not generating revenue for you, you have to really rethink your strategy. Yep. That's also really underrated. A lot of people think I'll open a YouTube channel, get some passive income and uh, just set up a uh, man. Good luck, man. It's pretty hard. And uh, we actually made a video last year, how much we made on YouTube with all the statistics and every analytics open there. And the thing I found very interesting is I watched a guy on YouTube, uh, he talks about YouTube channels in general, how they grow. And he said, YouTube shorts are getting pushed. They're getting pushed a lot because YouTube wants to compete with TikTok and Instagram shorts, obviously. But they're also by getting pushed on TV, which doesn't make sense because it's not, it's not matching the screen. So they push a YouTube short video on a big screen TV, which is horizontal, and the YouTube videos are vertical. Correct me if I'm wrong. So for creators... The shorts are vertical. YouTube videos are usually landscape, but the shorts are in portrait mode. Yes, and they get uh, pushed a lot, even on TV, people watching YouTube under TV. So you're missing out 80% of the screen. And now the weird thing is also that for creators... If you make more shorts, it actually hides your long-term videos, which actually make you money. So it's a whole different business. So if you upload one or two shorts and one real video or like a longer video, it gets like, how do you say, uh, crowded or it gets lost within those shorts. So YouTube recommends your shorts more. So people actually click less on the videos you want them to watch, which are the real ones. Even nowadays, when you can link the short towards a longer video. So you can put this link in the in the short that the hyperlinks towards the video and then the question is again is views a goal by itself or is it a goal enough for subscribers or maybe it's the same steve as having students in your gym do you want to have 100 students or do you want to have a thousand students or do you want to have quality students would you prefer 100 students that pay the rent and are shitty at jiu-jitsu that maybe are uh, not the kind of students you want or do you want 50 students which are uh, quality students which you can really engage with and i think that's a good link to make for short and long-term content. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also worth pointing out that sometimes there might be different pieces of information that you can communicate in different ways through short versus through long form content. Something that we do a lot is when we've got a topic for the week, like this week, we're talking about short form content, but let's say we were talking about grips. We've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks talking about grip fighting. What I'll do is I'll do maybe a whole episode breaking down something like that in long form. And then maybe I'll follow that up with a quick hit summary. We'll write a newsletter that expands upon that on Instagram and on Reddit. We'll create some slides that summarize that content. And the goal is to ultimately provide 
different lenses to the same idea. But really what I'm trying to do is keep people in the ecosystem, right? I put out the short form content in the hope that someone sees this maybe who's not familiar with us and it gets their interest because they think it's something useful. And then from there, maybe they can go and explore the long form content as well. So I don't want people to just see the short and then bail. I always want to make sure that my short form stuff and my long form stuff and my newsletter and my social posts to the best extent they can, I want them to all synergize because that also allows me then to hit people with the same message over and over again, right? A lot of the time when you listen to a long podcast, I mean, ours isn't even as long as some of the other ones, holy smokes. But if you listen to a one hour podcast, it's easy to forget some of the details or it's also easy to get lost in the conversation and you're enjoying it, but maybe you don't quite pick up on what the host perceived to be the key point. Maybe you took something else away from it. That's not bad, but the benefit to then following that up with a short or with a summary is it allows me to reinforce that lesson and maybe help steer and make sure people really focused on what I intended for them to focus on. So takeaway points. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's an underrated strategy is not just making short form and long form content, but figuring out how can I tie these together so that when people consume one, they're incentivized to then go and consume the other. Yep. So you thought of, you really thought it over. It sounds like you really thought it over and it's a good, can I say funnel? Does that make sense? I'm all about funnels. I'm all about funnels, man. I like my yeah. jujitsu funnels. <laughs> I like my strategic funnels. I like my content funnels. Yeah. And it, it is a good funnel to get them to get the step to the next step and to, it's all mixed together. We do the same thing. We have the, the end goal in mind, which is our courses at BJ Phonetics, for instance, but those are two hours and we just today released or at least released, we send it to the PGA Fanatics for editing our first short course, which is an hour. That is the end goal to have the full down the rabbit hole experience for our complete instructional. Then we have the YouTube videos, five to six minutes with a lot of information, but it leaves some stuff out there, what you're questioning about, which is answered in the instructional. And then we get those short videos on Instagram, on, I think we even have TikTok nowadays, but I don't run it. Some of the guys do. Yeah, we do have it. And YouTube shorts which just pops people's interest long enough just for 30 seconds or 10 seconds to go and watch a YouTube video, which then hopefully brings them to either the BG Fanatics or Short Course or the Patreon or whatever. And that's how I also think it short format has its place for us, but it shouldn't be the main goal. It shouldn't be the main focus. Even if we can get like hundreds of thousands of subscribers or views or a million views on TikTok, but if I only make short content, then what's the end goal? Like I cannot, I don't want to just make short content and recycle that all the time just to keep people's dopamine levels up. Yeah, that's a great point. The thing about short content is it has some benefits to the viewer in terms of it's quick and it's convenient, but it doesn't always necessarily create the best long-term relationship between the viewer and the creator. As an example, you've probably been to some of those landing pages where you go and they're trying to sell you something and it just goes on forever. Have you ever seen one of those where they're trying to sell you some online product and you have to scroll for about five minutes to get to the bottom because it's just like rambling about this person's history and the history of the product and you thought it was $300, but let's cross that out. Wait, you know, it's $100, but wait, there's more. And it just takes forever to get to the bottom. Those long landing pages are really interesting to me because my background is user experience design and usability. And one of the things that you're taught from day one is don't do that stuff because you're wasting the customer's time. You're overloading them with info. Most of that stuff isn't relevant. Give them what they want so they can get in and get out quick. And that sounds like good advice, but so many people do those long landing pages that supposedly break all the rules and they have tremendous success with them. And for a long time, I've been trying to figure out, okay, why is that? And I think part of it is just because if you can get someone to scroll through and read that whole landing page, you've already got them to commit a good chunk of their time. They're already semi-invested in that relationship with you because they've sat through that whole thing. Yes, you might've filtered out the people with the shorter attention spans, but they were probably never going to be your customers anyway. So I wonder sometimes if trying to be overly brief, it might create a quick positive dopamine hit for the customer. They get in, they get out but it doesn't really incentivize them to engage with the creator any further. And so I think, like you said, that can be a risk. Yes, you might see the view count go up, but those can be very transient views, just people who see it and then they forget about it and they move on to something else. Whereas if you can get people engaged in long form content, you've got some degree of commitment from them. And I think it makes it easier then to really help those people because you can build more of a relationship with them going forward. I would love to hear you riff on that if you agree with that assessment or if you think I'm wrong. And that, that makes a lot of sense, especially the thing about those landing pages. I always thought the people who made that never gave it a good thought, but I assume that they know what they're doing. And it does make sense to have people 
engage, just like maybe a good car salesman or something, if you get people to, okay, just take it for a test drive, just to, the more you get them into the process, the easier it is to then sell them the product. So that's really interesting. And I never studied for sales or anything on that subject, but uh, yeah, I could pick my brain for that. And on the podcast, maybe the same thing. I think in YouTube videos, for instance, most people watch or click away after the first minute or two minutes. That's the most that you spend. And it took me the hard way to find out that in the first minute, you've seen a lot of YouTube videos, I bet, in your life on Jiu-Jitsu or anything, but just to keep it Jiu-Jitsu. When they start out with, hey guys, by the way, before we get started, my name is blah, 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 from blah, blah, blah. I do this and blah, blah, blah. I want to thank my sponsor, what I think. And then you have to skip the first minute before the guy actually gets to the technique you're looking for. But once you're in that minute, especially if you start off, you give them some cool call like, hey guys, this is what we're going to do. And then it's easier for them to watch the whole clip till the end because... Like you said, they're already engaged, but you do have to engage them. You do have to make it interesting. I think the people decide to listen to a full podcast of you in the first, maybe they read the title and they listen to it. And then maybe in the first few minutes, I once clicked away a podcast where I just thought the topic would be interesting, but the audio just sucks. Not one of yours, by the way, <laughs> but you have to get them to commit to that first, well, I don't know, minute, two minutes. And then it does make sense. We're just saying that they, uh, that they're already committed and want to sit it out or see what's next at least. Yeah, man, getting the initial traction and the initial hook, the initial attention, it's so important. And sometimes it's very hard to know what's going to work. There's times when I've put out an episode and I thought, man, this one is gold. And then it just, I look at the metrics and it just didn't really perform. But then there's other times when I put out podcasts that, I mean, there was at least one episode where I really didn't think it was very good. I did not think it was some of my best work. I was actually even debating not releasing it, but my editor did an amazing job cleaning it up and I was happy enough with it to put it out there. And that episode just exploded. It was super popular. So the trick with being a creator is you never know what's really going to hook people. It's this combination of the right message at the right time in the right format, like little things like time of day makes such a huge difference to when you post things. Yeah. If only you know that just beforehand, man, we did the same thing with YouTube videos. Sometimes I make a video. I'm like, wow, this is a really good video. I'm, I really love this. And we just get a few 10,000s of views or whatever, a few thousands. And then I have a video. I'm like, yeah, just another video, another weekly upload. And it gets hundreds of thousands of views as a YouTube video. I'm like, how the hell, how can we notice what's, we're doing the same thing, guys. What makes this one pop out? And yeah, if you could tell me that, uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear that. But it's, it's really hard to find this out. But now we're still talking, uh, Steve, from the perspective of content creators. And I think most people listening are not content creators, right? But everyone consumes content in a way. I don't know, man. It really feels to me like every dumbass in this sport either has a podcast or a YouTube channel. Maybe everyone <laughs> out there is a content creator. <laughs> well, at least a TikTok channel. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, look, based on the attendance of people on this recording right now, 100% of us have either a podcast or a YouTube channel or both. So, you know, a lot of us do. But yes, you're right. You're right. The viewer's perspective or the listener's perspective is a totally different thing. And in fact, there's arguments to be made that there's kind of a dark side to short form content. I'm sure you're going to want to talk about yeah. that. So yeah, I'll turn the <laughs> mic back over to you here. I'm so predictable, right? But let's face it, there's a fact and people are, I'm not talking about jujitsu. I'm just talking about general. People are reading less and less. People are watching shorter movies. The Hollywood movies are getting shorter as well. When's the last time you've seen it? Well, except for June, for instance, but most recent videos and films are getting shorter, text is getting shorter. And the overall attention span is declining. So I have a study here that says in 2004, the average attention span on any screen is to be two and a half minutes on average. And then throughout the years, it becomes shorter and shorter. Now it's around 75 seconds. So there is the fact that people's attention span is getting shorter. I think we're getting good on that. The exact statistics, well, they differ from study to study and whatever, but it's a fact. I see this as well with the students we teach, especially the kids when we go to schools and teach uh, workshops or projects, they have a short attention span. So that's the fact. Now, how we play along with that in uh, as content creators, okay, that's a subject we've already been discussing, but can discuss them for longer. But also, how do you deal with that as an athlete or just practitioner or hobbyist? And how do you deal with that as a coach? So we're all in all of these roles. And I think as a jiu-jitsu practitioner, it's hard to filter out all the information because there's so many videos on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts with jiu-jitsu techniques or jiu-jitsu tips or jiu-jitsu whatever you want to call it or short podcast clips. But the problem is also everyone and their mom can pick up a podcast microphone or record themselves on TikTok with jiu-jitsu techniques. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that all of it is good content and that it is what you should focus on in training. And I think that's where a good coach comes along to also help you guide through that enormous ocean of knowledge and say, hey man, it's really cool that you're looking up all of these buggy chokes, but this is your second class. Maybe focus on passing guard or whatever, or yeah, sure, that's a video on TikTok, but I'm not sure if it's a really good technique or you should try this in competition. It might be illegal or prone to injury or whatever. So there's so many, never before has there been so much information out there for free, Steve. It's, a lot of stuff is for free on TikTok, Instagram, whatever, but that doesn't necessarily always mean for the better. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a paradox of abundance where there's so much stuff out there that it actually gets hard to know what to consume. It's interesting. I remember when I was a kid, I mean, I've been a gamer my whole life. I love video games. When I was a kid, I remember there just weren't that many video games that were coming out, right? It was still an, an emerging field. And so there might be a game that was coming out and you would buy it. And there was really only one new game and you'd play that for a, quite a while until some next one came out. And also games back then were very expensive. I mean, I remember there was a racing game in the nineties for the Sega Genesis that cost like $129 in 1990. 90s money. That would be like 250 to 300 dollars today for a video game. Unbelievable. But you look at it now and there's so much good stuff out there. If you're a gamer, there is just a an embarrassment of riches. There's so much stuff to play and so much of it is dirt cheap compared to what it used to be. Same with content. We were talking about how, you know, we used to all when we were younger, there would be a show on and it was at 7 p.m. at night and you had to sit down and watch it because if you missed it, you missed it. And then none of your buddies would be able to talk to you about what happened tomorrow at school because you didn't see the show. You had one chance to watch it and you missed it. And if you got it for a bathroom break, there was no pause button. You were screwed. You think about that now, you've got how many streaming services that you have ready access to, how much content is just available for pennies at your fingertips. And this can create an analysis paralysis problem where instead of having too little to consume because you've got so much, you can almost paralyze yourself. I mean, how many times have you sat down on the couch to watch something at night, you pop open Netflix and you spend a whole freaking hour just trying to decide what to watch? Every time. My girlfriend and I just, we take 10 minutes to pick a movie or a series or anything. And then it's it's already late, so there's nothing left. Same goes with YouTube content. I have so many videos on YouTube that I'm, oh, I want to watch this later. I want to watch this later. And then another thumbnail pops up, takes all of my dopamine and tension which is already short span, <laughs> I admit. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch this. And then I was, what was I looking for to begin with? And then Instagram pops up. And then now as we speak, uh, CGI is happening. It's for free. It's for free to live stream on YouTube. By the way, no offense, but better quality than Flow Grappling, less lagging, but it's for free. You can watch it at any time, instant gratification. And I'm really in tune with that paralysis sometimes when there's so much content, so much technique, so much stuff. And that's to turn it back to what I was saying to have someone like a coach or yourself or at least educate yourself to not look for information but to maybe focus on okay i can leave this out or what should i focus on now maybe for my jiu-jitsu journey yeah you know what in the world of usability and user experience they call this hicks law and the idea is that the more choices you overload someone with the harder it is for them to make a decision it takes them longer to make a decision to the point where they may just opt out and decide simply not to make a decision at all because it's too much work. This is why for so long, Apple had so few options in terms of their products. They've expanded a bit since then, but it used to be that, you know, they had a few variations and that was it. And part of that was because much like how, when you go to a really fancy restaurant, there is a short curated list. Whereas when you go to a fast food chain, there's a massive amount of things you can order. Part of it is because they're trying to provide a curated experience and reduce that kind of overload. If you can get people to make a decision quickly, then that's going to be better for you as the person providing the content than if you put so many options in front of them that they just, they get confused and they give up and go somewhere else. So this is why in the world of software, part of usability studies involves trying to remove the number of unnecessary clutter and options on the screen, because the more stuff you put in front of someone, the harder it will be for them to make a decision. And if it's a purchasing decision, they might just say, you know what, forget this. I'm out. This is just too hard. I don't have time to learn it. I think jujitsu is very much in a similar place where there is so much content out there that just the act of filtering through it and trying to figure out what's good and what's not good and what is appropriate for you and what isn't, 
that's more time consuming than actually consuming the content itself. And that's why having a noise filter, like you said, a good coach or someone who can take on that burden for you is so critical. And that's part of what I hope we do on this podcast is provide a degree of that. Yeah. Yeah. Good recommendations on the podcast. I just wanted to say good, a good podcast to recommend. Yeah. I mean, part of what we want to do is provide that noise filter and really direct people to the things that are likely to make quick hit gains in their jujitsu. My current hot take is that watching jujitsu instructionals is probably overrated. And I'm not saying that it, it isn't valuable. There's a lot of good stuff there, but there is so much stuff out there. And there are people out there who basically make a full-time job out of studying instructionals. And I would guess that a lot of the stuff they study just winds up being dead ends. It's trivia in their heads, stuff that takes up space in their brain, but they never use it. I kind of wonder if a more simplified approach focusing on live training and maybe having a, like a coach kind of dictate where you should focus would be more helpful at the end of the day. Well, that's very interesting if you to say. So let me pluck something really cool there. So first off, uh, that overload of choices Man, I have this in the grocery store as well. You see 20 brands of peanut butter. I'm like, what am I even choosing? It's smooth or it's extra peanut chunks. I don't even know, man. I just want peanut butter. But uh, with jujitsu, the same thing. I agree with you on instructionals, but it also goes for the specific instructional, how it is formatted and also how you approach it. Because I think with a good instructional also comes a good responsibility to take it. A lot of people, they look at, I always say this when I start my instructionals, don't binge this. If you can watch this instructional one night, you didn't get the point. Watch a short piece, a short concept. Now drill this for a few weeks or months or whatever long it takes. And then come back to it and go to the next chapter. And the way you use the information is also very important. Just like a book. If you get a book on business success, you just read the whole thing out in an hour. I don't think you get the idea. I don't think you get the key tools to then use that in your in your business or whatever. But that's a different subject. Now, something that's really cool is we also see different platforms. So usually we had, back in our day, we had Jiu-Jitsu books and uh, videos. Now recently we have the instructionals. Besides BJ Fanatics, we got Jiu-Jitsu, we got Jiu-Jitsu Axe, we got all these platforms. And now you see Lachlan with his super cool submit. I'm a big fan of Lachlan Giles. And I think I mention him every time I'm on any podcast, but uh, so shout out to him. His submeta, have you ever seen it, Steve? Absolutely. I have said before that submeta is, as far as I'm concerned, the most complete online video academy you'll find. Maybe there's situations where I might recommend another one, depending on what a person is looking for. But in general, if you want a really good, really high quality, complete video academy, Submeta should always be the first thing that you check out. I 100% support the message and agree with that. So that's really well structured. I think the quality is also really good. Now, here's one. I think you haven't heard of it. I would be interested if you heard of it. It's called the BGG Project. I have not heard of it. Plug it. Tell me about it. So it's a few guys from Australia. They set up a platform, I think, uh, a year ago or whatever, just recently where instead of, hey guys, this is a library with content, they make the students focus on beginners. I think folks mostly on white and blue belts, maybe purple belts. They make them fill out a form and then they get as a result, they get like this. I'm not sure if I, I, if I say it correctly in English, but it's like a, a diaphragm, what I was called, a, a chart where you see your strengths and weaknesses in jiu-jitsu and then they match your results with the course or an instructor. And they have some dedicated instructors where they take content from some accomplished competitors, some well-known YouTube uh, content creators, and they use that content to match your specific strength, weaknesses, or questions, as opposed to not naming any other platforms, but here's a lot of content, good luck, and just see whatever you like. And I think that's a really cool way to approach it. And instead of buying the product, you just pay a monthly fee, I think it's 20 bucks or something, whatever, to get access to the database and have videos provided to you matching the stuff you're struggling with on your results and on your journey. They call it the Jiu-Jitsu journey score or your Jiu-Jitsu score. And it's very interesting and they're growing a lot now. And of course, I'm really excited about it because I'm one of the coaches on there. But that's a coincidence. That's also why I heard about them. But it's really cool to see how they switch the form instead of, hey guys, here's content, find your way through it. They have you take this test where you fill it out. Honestly, you get a Jitsu score. And from that score, you can clearly see, okay, these are the things I'm struggling with. How do I approach that? Who can you pluck with me? Who can you connect with me? What videos should I watch? And then they kind of guide you through the journey. I think that's really interesting to see that development of content platforms, just like Submeta, which I think is really good, instead of just navigating your own way through the woods, which you do on social media, for instance. Yeah, I think tailored content and deep study are a thing that we're going to see people try to reclaim quite a bit. A problem with 
having so much content readily available is that it creates this constant fear of missing out where you feel like, well, I've got to finish this instructional so that I can get onto the next one because there's so much content that I've got to consume, so much stuff I have to study, and there's only so many hours in the day. So I think sometimes that encourages people to just blitz through stuff without really focusing and engaging with it just so they can check off the box and move on to the next instructional they feel they're supposed to study. Interestingly, um, Josh Waitzkin, author of The Art of Learning, talks about his approach to mastery and it's very much the opposite. It's very much deep study. He will pick one thing and laser in on it for extended periods of time. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of the opposite of how we engage with content now, where we feel like just more, 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 we've got to get through it. I've sometimes felt if you were to just pick one thing, rather than trying to watch 10 instructionals this month, watch one instructional, study it actively 10 times, make a training practice out of it, actually integrate it with your training. I think you're going to get a lot more out of that than just doing a Netflix style binge of every jujitsu instructional that you have. Yeah, But that's the hard part, Steve, because people look at it like, oh, I'll just drink these protein shakes and don't go to the gym and I should get big by itself. No, it doesn't work like that. Just watching the instructional doesn't make you better. It's a tool and it's up to you to then apply it in practice or in trading and then come back to it, as I just mentioned earlier with what I always say in the beginning of my instructionals, please don't binge this. Take a part of it, drill it with your partners, come back, rewind, and only when you feel, okay, I'm comfortable for the next step, go to the next step. So good instructionals should take you months or even a year to apply and watch the whole product instead of a night. And I think deep study, like you just said, is that maybe we can make the link to Danaher's stuff, which is really deep on details, but also you have to be really focused to watch it. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is something that people often ask me if I want to start listening to BJJ mental models, where do I have to do and in what order? And my answer is always just, please don't think of it that way. I try really hard to organize things so that you can drop in and drop out at any time you want. You should get value out of listening to anything in any order, and you should not feel like you have to listen to everything. This isn't Game of Thrones where you need to watch everything in sequence. And if if you miss one episode, you got no idea what's going on. And I think that that's an important attitude to take with content is not feeling like you have to check all the boxes, not feeling like you have to consume every single thing, but rather picking the things that interest you and really focusing on those things until you've absorbed all of the value and then you move on to something else. And then back to what we mentioned, if those things are good for you. Well, another dark side of content might be as we look to the coach. So imagine the coach running a jiu-jitsu gym and every smart ass white belt gets up to him and says, hey man, but uh, Gordon Ryan shows it like this. Nowadays we call it a choy bar. Now it's like this inverted uh, uh, bolo, whatever. They come up with all of these things And I think it also puts pressure on maybe the more old school coaches to feel like they're missing out or that they're not adequately enough on the new age styles. Do you understand what I'm meaning? So imagine you're a coach, you're uh, 10 years in your black belt, you've been teaching, you learned all the fundamentals, really good fundamentals. And someone comes up, yeah, how do we do about the J-point, high step passing, et cetera. And you're like, what? That might be a hard thing to deal with as a coach, especially we always say there's no ego left in jiu-jitsu. That's bullshit. There's still ego. But it's also a good thing because it prevents coaches and gyms from becoming Mac dojos because you have to stay up to date. Don't you agree? You have to stay up with the development of jiu-jitsu, which is going super fast, because even if you don't, your students do because they get access to it anyways. So there's an interesting paradox. Yeah, it's a tricky one. On one hand, you need that competitive pressure to learn more or else coaches will get stuck in the past and they won't evolve. But on the other hand, more information is not always better. Most of the new techniques out there, most of the things you see, they're going to wind up being evolutionary dead ends that maybe they appear, they get fed into people's social channels for a while, and then they never really go anywhere. So that puts a coach in a difficult situation where on one hand, They're expected to spend all of this time knowing all of this stuff. But on the other hand, a lot of that stuff isn't going to go anywhere. So it's a very hard thing for a coach to know what to focus on and to identify things that maybe aren't the best thing to focus on. This is also a reason why it's so important to have a coach who can do this for you. Because if you're a white or a blue belt, you're probably not going to be good at isolating and identifying what you really need to learn right now. Exactly. And then I've seen this not once, not twice, but many times you get these high level blue belts, let's call it like that, so everyone feels uh, appreciated, who know all the latest techniques and then they get triangled by the hobbyist purple belt dad 
next to them or they get they can't escape back mount so then the right thing about maybe worm guarder or bolos or a lot of modern stuff but they don't know how to pass guard and then your coach as a veteran should say hey man yes it's really cool to drill this new stuff and it's it's the same thing as we've been seeing like last decade last decade steve it was leg locks and heel looks right everyone in the mom needed to learn leg locks and then people stopped passing guard and focusing on fundamentals and everyone knew all of these lag log shoutouts. And I'm being super hypercritical because I love lag logs. I have two instructions on the lag log, So I'm the last person to say anything about don't drill lag logs. But there's a place and a time for everything. If you're a white belt, maybe stop focusing on helix and playing saddle. And maybe, just maybe, learn a few sweeps, passes, pop pins, and escapes. And it's up to the coach or up to you to get the responsibility to filter out this content and if you want to get better obviously you can just do whatever you want and just kick away your dopamine and scroll tiktok uh, for all i care but if you want to get better if you want to filter stuff if you want to see okay where does it fit into my game you have to at least be aware that not everything that's really cool and hip is always for the better and should always be your main focus i've got a quote here i want to share with you it's from shane Parrish. he's the person behind farnham street and the knowledge project and the quote is filtering is a superpower The people you don't hang around, the opportunities you don't accept, the distractions you don't allow, the relationships you don't have, the news you don't read, the content you don't consume. Saying no is how you turn filtering into action. And I think that's super important here. Again, I think that is an area where we will start to see the pendulum swing in the other direction and we will see people realize that more is not always better. And in fact, setting up a wall that cuts out the noise can be one of the best things that you do. I've really started trying to do that recently and to not feel FOMO when I'm not following all of the modern trends. It's led to a much more peaceful life. I do feel guilty sometimes because I often feel like I'm out of the zeitgeist and I don't know what people are talking about, but it also allows me to focus a lot more on the things that I really do want to do. And it's been very helpful for me. So I think we're going to see more coaches, like you said, move in that direction where they start curating the attention of their athletes. I think it's especially hard for the coaches to deal with that FOMO. If all your students around you are talking about the latest trends in techniques that are just firing up on TikTok or whatever, and you're like, hey, this is Jitsu I know, this is Jitsu I want to share with you out of love and passion. Hey, should I stay up to date with all of these new developments or not? I think it takes a lot of character to stand strong and say, nope, we're going to focus this is the style my gym runs. And maybe they also fear losing students if there's another gym in town that's really modern or new way for how do you call it so i think the coach has a hard task at hand on the subject of content because he's competing against people who are sharing techniques for free on the internet which aren't always for the better but it's also as i said a nice pressure to push the coach to keep on developing as well i myself am more up to date with youtube content nowadays as a coach because i feel this slight fomo of missing out on new information also because I'm a jitsu nerd, but also it plays, there's a voice in my head that says, hey, Tim, you got to stay up to date. And have you checked out the latest batches? Have you checked out this? And have you checked out that instructional and whatever? And to want to stay up to date, but also feel this pressure to stay up to date as a good coach, because you want to be a good coach to your students. So that plays a part. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I have to ask you this on the topic of short form content. Where do you fall on this from an ethical standpoint? Because one of the things you brought up is that Part of the reason why short form content works so well for getting attention and part of the reason why these social media platforms push it so heavily is because they know people will watch it. It does something to the brain, right? Those quick dopamine hits, it just does something to us. And to some extent, that might not be something healthy. I've got a young daughter and I observed this firsthand. If she sits down and watches long form content, she behaves one way. If she sits down and watches short form content, it changes her behavior and not for the better. And I'd be curious to know, how do we balance this? I mean, it is a tool and there are very valid use cases for using short form content, but we also want to be helping people. We don't want to be trapping them in a dopamine loop, right? So what do you suggest we do to make short form content that actually takes advantage of that format rather than trying to trap people or to ultimately create harm? That's an excellent question. I would love for you to elaborate a little bit on that, what you just said about your daughter without getting too personal, because uh, just stop me if I'm getting too personal, but you said you see a difference, but can you, what do you see exactly in, in practice? Because I'm really curious. This is very anecdotal, right? This is two very biased parents observing a child and just kind of seeing how she behaves. But what we mm-hmm. found sure. is, for example, if she sits down and watches a long form television show, she is much easier to engage with. She'll put it away afterwards and move on to other things. But if she watches shorts on YouTube kids, 
there's just constant quick hits of little exciting things. And she kind of, you can see her attention get sucked into this vortex. She won't pay attention to anything else around her. When you try to pull her attention away, she gets very irritable about it. Again, this might be a bias, right? Maybe my wife and I are just biased against short form content and we're seeing a pattern that's not there, but it really feels like it brings out kind of the worst in her behavior. And like you said, there's reason to believe that constant exposure to short form content can be damaging to our attention span. So for those reasons, we filter that out for our kid now and we try to avoid giving her access to that. We encourage more longer form experiences. If she's going to sit down and use electronics, then we try to make sure that it's something engaging and that requires a more extended period of focus. That's kind of what I'm talking about here in terms of what we've observed. But again, this is just personal biased anecdotal experience. So please don't take this as a study or any sort of definitive evidence. No, it's really good. And it's very nice to hear that you're so honest and reflecting that the way you see it and how it can be interpreted and that you could be biased. So that's that's really cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think on your question to elaborate a bit more on the ethical point of view, I'm really struggling with this as a person. I have a lot of discussions with my editor for YouTube. He always says, yeah, we should use more clickbait and guys, the three best submissions ever or a must know escape or must know secret thing. I don't do that. We don't do that on thumbnails. I'm, I'm trying to play around with it, but I really want to stay within my values and don't clickbait people into stuff or don't just dopamine bait them. So I have very strong ethical feelings, I think, which are sometimes holding me back. I think for the results, if we just take results like heart demographics, like uh, viewers, subscribers, and dollars, I think those are really hard results. I'd rather have fewer of those, all three above, retain my values as opposed to just sell them away or be a sellout just to get the views. So I'm really biased on that as well. And I don't think I'm the best person to ask it, but nonetheless, I think the best thing to say is like a, to wrap up the things we've been speaking about today, like a sort of quote. I think we have to agree that short short content is here to stay and becomes bigger and bigger. Even if we don't want to, all the platforms are pushing it. We see this with YouTube Shorts. I think it has its place if you use it wisely, as we mentioned with coaches or you yourself. I think the best thing to quote is to say that short content is like a tool or a stepping stone for to get in-depth study and it's not a replacement of. So let me just say it like this. Short content format is not a replacement of, but a stepping stone to enlightenment or whatever you want to call it or learning. Let's put it like that. I think there it has its its beautiful place. And there it's it's a good addition to the longer formats to, like you said, what your daughter watches longer formats or reading a book or like a podcast. I think the mini episodes or snippets from your podcast are really good, but they are in addition to the true product, which is, which is the full podcast, the full experience, the full in-depth experience of the subject or the product. I think that's where it should have its place and not as a, I would be really sad to see more and more series or short series or short movies and less and less good movies, good stories, good long podcasts, good conversations, good YouTube videos and only see quick dopamine shots of color and moving cameras. I agree with that. I think that short form content has a great potential to give people a quick summary of what they can learn if they take the deeper dive. I think when you use short form content as the end in and of itself, just to collect people's attention, I would say that's not a great approach. But the nice thing about short form content is you can make it synergize with long form content. You can use it to show highlights or main lessons from your longer form material to direct people there. The other thing too, is you can do it in reverse. We talked earlier about how frustrating and sad it can be sometimes when you make something and you're really proud of it, but it just dies. Nobody watches that episode. Sometimes what happens is maybe if you put out an episode that you think was underloved or you put out some content that you would have expected it to perform better. You think that more people would benefit from consuming that. What you can do after the fact is make more short form material that clips out the highlights from that. And that can then draw people's attention back to something they might've missed. So it can also give that long form content a second life where it draws attention to it after the fact, and it can bring things back if they've already kind of fallen out of people's feeds. So I think there's ways that you can use it. I think it's just a matter of being thoughtful about it and not trying to create these quick snappy things just for the purpose of getting attention. I think you need to have a broader vision for what you want to educate people on and how you want to help people than just taking their attention. Yeah, I 100% agree, Steve. So it's really interesting to see what is your focus and what is the thing you stand for. For instance, BJ Fanatics, known for their longer term content, 
they get hundreds of thousands or even 500K or maybe a million views on their longer videos, videos from five to four minutes, encouraging instructionals or promoting instructionals, that's word, or their longer podcast. But their short videos, if you look at the most recent shorts, they have like 900 views, 600 views, 500 views, 20 views. It's ridiculously low compared to their longer formats. People go there to watch long format content. So I'm not sure if short format has a place for everyone and for everything. And maybe for other people, it does. And you see some coaches on YouTube also really implementing it really good and having it support the main thing they do. But I found it really interesting when I looked at Fanatics YouTube to see that their shorts are really underperforming compared to their regular videos. That was super interesting. Where usually the shorts get more views, but the long videos views are, they're more important. The the quality is better, let's say like that. Great insights, man. Well, before we close this out, anything else you want to touch on? Is there anything that you think is worth bringing up that we missed so far? No, I'm really curious because I also wanted to say we have to keep this short content that we're around wrapping up. But now I'm curious, Steve, are we going to see more short content or snippets from you or from BJ Mental Models? Maybe more reels on your socials? You know, honestly, I've talked about this a few times, I think on some of the premium episodes that we did more on the business side. I found that for me, and maybe this is just the specific type of content that people come to BJJ Mental Models for, we used to do a lot of reels because everyone told us, you know, reels are the way to go if you want to post on Instagram. And they got okay engagement, but some of the other stuff that we're doing, interestingly, a lot of static image stuff, especially stuff where it's like slides that quickly summarize key concepts. I love the quotes. You guys have those really good quotes. Yeah, those do really well. So I probably won't lean too heavy into reels unless someone can convince me that for my audience, they would resonate more. But I think for our particular type of content, very audio focused, I sometimes wonder if people come to us because they're looking for a refuge from all of the video stuff. And so I kind of just go where the interest goes. And what I found so far is, of course, humor is always going to go well. So we've got a lot of, you know, memes and stuff on there. I love to just troll people on the internet. So I'm doing that all the time. But also on top of that, just like slides, quick summaries of concepts, important lessons. The Black Belt Pro tips you have, those are really good as well. Those are all bullshit. I hate to tell you, those are those are all jokes. <laughs> no, 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 no. That makes them so good. Yes. Well, I, I'm glad you appreciate that, man. But yeah, anything you wanted to close out with, don't forget to plug your stuff. I mean, tell us about how people can contact you, get your instructionals. And if you're participating on BJJ Project, I want to hear about that as well. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys are still listening up to this point, I'm just really happy that you guys are still here. That's it. You can find all my stuff, whatever, in any links. I think you'll uh, you'll post them somewhere. Just type in Tum Energy Anywhere or Energy on Martial Arts, whether that be on BJ Fanatics, Instagram, where you put short content format, or YouTube, where you put a little bit of longer content format on Energy on Martial Arts, or uh, just put in my name on BJ Fanatics. I got a new course dropping, well, actually today. I sent it to them today. It's short course. It's uh, just an hour. I also made it a little bit cheaper as a normal course so to fill in that gap. So there's something for everyone. Quick dopamine, longer. <laughs> We're trying to fill in all the gaps and matching this episode subject. I really want to uh, excite people for the PGG project. Not because I'm on it. I'm not even sure if, uh, if they'll keep me on or whatever. But I think it's a really cool new way to engage with jiu-jitsu techniques as opposed to just uh, watching instructionals. So uh, I don't think there's a best way I don't think there's the best thing if it's Instagram, TikTok. I think it's what matches you. And you just said there's no such thing as learning in a certain way. I can agree with that, but there's also enjoying in a certain way. Some people really just love to watch our YouTube videos and they will never buy an instructional and that's perfectly fine. And other people love my instructionals, but don't even watch my YouTube channel, which is for free. And that's also perfectly fine. We just try to offer Jitsu for everyone and think if you want to check it out and you like, uh, well, don't base it on my English in this podcast because that's very hard. But on video, it's a bit better, guys. Just check it out <laughs> and I hope you guys enjoy it. Steve, thank you so much, man. I love how you say that because your English is totally fine. <laughs> well, except for the stuttering because that's when, when it's just translating in my head or it's the Google Translate running in my head. Tom, English is my first language and I still stutter all the time. That's just completely normal. <laughs> yeah, but you have the sweet voice of a podcast host, so that's really cool. Uh, well, thanks, man. I'm glad to have you. I'll put links to all of your stuff in the show notes. So if people aren't sure how to spell things or they forget the names, just go check out the show notes. You will have a one-click option to contact Tomb, check out his stuff, check out his instructionals. I'll also put a link to all of our stuff. Everything we make lives at bjjmentalmodels.com. Like I said earlier, there is no requirement to listen to every episode sequentially. I always tell 
people just grab an episode. If the title captures your interest, give it a listen. It'll probably help you out. If you're ever unsure of what to check out, or if you have a specific problem, by the way, don't be a stranger. Just go to our website, fill in the contact form. I read every message that everyone sends to me, and I'd be happy to help you kind of point to the right direction if there's a problem that you're particularly looking to solve. So do feel free to reach out there. You can also get our awesome newsletter on the website, our database of concepts, and that's also how you can sign up for BJJ Mental Models Premium. Uh, We keep everything ad-free, and the reason we're able to do that is because of our BJJ Mental Models Premium subscribers. If you sign up there, you'll get access to the world's largest library of jiu-jitsu audio courses on strategy, tactics, mindset, mental models. So if you like this method of delivery, we've got a ton of amazing content there. We've also got ongoing podcasts hosted by some amazing competitors and analysts that are exclusive to BJJ Mental Models Premium. You also get access to our Discord community, which is probably worth a membership in and of itself and a bunch of other cool perks and stuff that I don't have the time to line up here. But again, go to bjjmentalmodels.com to get all of that, to find out all of the info you need. And I hope people check out premium. I really appreciate it. And Tum, I also hope people check out your stuff, man. I really appreciate you coming by here as well. Awesome. And on behalf of the community, man, thank you so much for keeping it all ad-free. And that's a really beautiful display of character. So uh, thank you on that. Final plug, guys, if you're ever in the Netherlands or in Europe, visit our gyms. Come train with us, come roll with us. We have open mass, we have classes, whatever. If you're from abroad or country abroad, no need to pay a drop-in fee. Just drop in, roll with the guys and feel welcome. Absolutely. Well, man, I hope I get to meet you one day. Netherlands is a place I've wanted to go to for a long time. It would be my pleasure. I'll show you around. <laughs> Apparently, we have a really big contingent of followers in the Netherlands, so I might have to give that a go. I'd love to come over there. But thanks a lot for the invite. Oh, you should. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, Tune, for coming by. Take care, buddy. And thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you in the next one. See you soon. Bye.